Good morning. Good morning. This is the day. Let us rejoice. I am Shanta Haywood, and I have the distinct honor of presiding over today's Founders Day program and also serving Albany State University in the capacity of Interim Vice President for Institutional Advancement. <coughs> to our alum, to our parents and guardians, to our students, to our faculty and to our staff, to members of the Holly family, President Dunning and Mrs. Dunning, and son Dunning, <laughs> how are you this morning? To the provost and to all of our distinguished guests, I'd like to welcome you all to Albany State University's Founders Day. We have speakers. We have someone who will bring the occasion. And before we get to that part, we will post the colors. Thank you. You may be seated. I'd like to open up our program by paying a special homage to our founder. His was a mission and a calling to, as he writes in his autobiography, you can't build a chimney from the ground up his was a calling to build a school that would strike a blow to the ignorance portrayed by, du by Mr. Du Bois in the souls of black folk. Dr. Holly wrote that in his autobiography. And being the daughter of a preacher myself, please allow me to get a little piece of the spirit today by alluding to something else that Dr. Holly says when he writes that our, when he speaks about the school's endurance, the school's triumph over challenges by nature, and when he speaks of the times of civil change that the school has endured, Dr. Simmons, and to all of our pastors here, this school was really founded on the knees and on the prayers for Dr. Holly. At this time, we will have an invocation by Reverend Eddie Adams. Thank you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather here today on this wonderful occasion celebrating 111 years of educational excellence, but also, Father, something very powerful also in the life and the legacy of Dr. Holly. Lord, we are so thankful for visionaries. We're so thankful for the forerunners in our life and for the pioneers that go before us and who have the courage and the boldness, God, to take a stand and to lift up a banner beyond themselves, a banner for our culture and our society and our world that will make a difference. And Father, we pray that today you will challenge us each and every one as we celebrate 
Not only those 111 years, God, of educational and leadership and community excellence here at Albany State University, but as we also celebrate the life and the legacy of Dr. Holly. Lord, I pray that you will challenge us, each and every one, in our own way to make a difference in our world and our society around us. Father, we pray that you would challenge us and mantle us and anoint us with a courage and a boldness and that we will leave this place today being inspired, God, by those things that we hear and those things that are represented. Father, we pray now that your blessing would be placed upon everything in this special Founders Day celebration and God that we would leave here being world changers ourselves after being inspired by those who have gone before us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Dr. Holly started Albany State University, it started in a time of a lot of discord. Imagine if the world were as harmonious as this choir was this morning, how different it would be. Join me in giving them another round of applause. At this time, you will get the occasion from Miss Albany State University, followed by a special tribute to our founder, and then we will get greetings from members of our community and from members of the university community. Good morning, I am Antoinette Skipper, Miss Albany State University. And on behalf of Royal Court 2013-2014, I would like to say we are here to celebrate a true legacy of an astounding historical university. For 111 years, we have put our trust in thee. We will continue to see all the best and of course give praises to all the rest. Welcome to the Founders Day Convocation of the unsinkable Albany State University. Thank you. Well, praise the Lord, everybody. <laughs> All right. I am Cornelia Pinky Modesti, Grant and Contract Administrator for Institutional Advancement. To our president, Dr. Durden, our speaker, Dr. McKendrick, other distinguished guests, alumni, faculty, staff, students, and friends. It is an honor to stand before you to pay homage to a great man. You see, this man we're celebrating, Dr. Joseph Winslow Holly, was not just an ordinary man. He was an extraordinary man with much, much determination. He was born in 1874 to former slaves and his first ambition was to become a minister. And he prepared, by, he prepared for that by completing his education at Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. He went on to earn a degree at Phillips Academy in Andover, Massachusetts. Somewhere along the way, Dr. Holly read a book called The Souls of Black Folk, a book about the horrible horrible living conditions of black people in South Florida, South Georgia, written by W.E.B. Du Bois. Shocked by what he read, Dr. Holly was so moved until he left Massachusetts and relocated to Albany, Georgia. He came here to start a school. With the help of just $2,600, that was a gift from his friend in Massachusetts, Roland Hazard, Dr. Car Dr. Harley organized a board of trustees and bought 50 acres of land to start his institution. He did it all in just one year. In 1903, hundred. And 11 years ago, he founded the Albany Bible and Manual Training Institute to provide elementary education and teacher training for the local black population. After many progressions, in 1996, the old Bible college became who we are today, Albany State University now spread over 231 acres and still spreading. If we really want to pay respect and honor to this great man, then we must begin to duplicate, motivate, and dedicate. Let us duplicate the tenacity of Dr. Harley by persevering to make Albany State University a great university, a, a university to be recognized, to stand with the best. Let us motivate our students to become leaders of leaders, to do the impossible. And finally, 
for the alumni, those that are in the spring of life, and those like me who are in the winter months, I mean autumn months. <laughs> Let us make sure that there will be an Albany State University. God said he would make us the lender and not the borrower. ASU needs our support. ASU needs our financial support. Let us decide to dedicate our resources to keep Dr. Holly's dream alive. Let us make sure Dr. Holly's work was not in vain. Duplicate, motivate, dedicate. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Modesti, for those very inspiring words. And in order to duplicate, and to motivate, we need to collaborate with members of our community and on our campus. So at this time, we will hear from our mayor, and after that, our county commissioner, a member of the Holly family, as well as Ms. Dejanee Thompson, and the president of our alumni association. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. It is a pleasure for me to be with you this morning on behalf of the Board of Commissioners and the citizens of Albany, Georgia, many of whom are graduates of this great institution. We pay tribute to the life and legacy of our founder, Dr. Joseph Winthrop Holly, and we celebrate 111 years of academic excellence. We here in the Albany community owe a tribute to Dr. Holly and to Albany State University for the contributions that have been made to Albany, Georgia, the state of Georgia, and this nation. Our Founded, and a foundation was laid on Christian principles. We know that I cared about others because he came to Southwest Georgia to wipe out illiteracy. Dr. Joseph went that you can't build a chimney from the top. So that is why he laid a strong foundation for us a foundation that would stand the test of time, a foundation that would stand the storms with the hard winds blowing, the thunder roaring, and the lightning flashing. Dr. Joseph Winthrop Holly laid a foundation that would survive the storms, the tornadoes, the hurricanes, and the rising floodwaters. Because he laid the foundation a foundation set on Christian principles. He was a Christian example. His dreams live on through us. As mayor, I bring you greetings on behalf of the city of Albany, Georgia, and I salute our founder, Dr. Joseph Winthrop Holly, for laying the strong foundation that has endured, survived for 100 and 11 years. Think about that. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. This is kind of an exciting day. You think about 111 years, and you could easily say, this is another Founders Day. Oh. Well, it's not. It's a Founders Day, a special Founders Day. And I know Dr. Holly is up there, and I see some of his family here this morning, and they've got to be thinking about specifically the foundation that he and so many with him laid. And so many of you have helped to create in such a way that it just gets better each day, each month, each year. It's making such a difference in our community and, quite frankly, in our region, our state. The leadership here 
and the continued progress that this college continues to make to bring our students to a higher level provides opportunity. It also provides something bigger than opportunity. It allows these young folks to have a vision, to have confidence that they will leave here with the ability to have a place in life for their family. There is nothing more important than to have a place where you can leave, go into the workplace, be confident, get a job, and be able to secure financially the things that we all dream of. Because family is a base, God is there watching and guiding the family, and once all that comes together, it's up to what people learn and how they apply that in society and at the workplace it makes a difference. This is a great, great, great day because it is a Founders Day celebrating 111 years of incredible history. And boy, I sure am happy to be here representing the county commission, the citizens of Darty County, and quite frankly, anyone that'll listen to us to tell them we got a good story to tell. Thank y'all. Good morning. As you can already tell, I am not Josephine Holly Jefferson. Ms. Jefferson uh, was unable to be here with us uh, for the first time in many, many years. But she was, um, didn't want to let this day pass without her presence being known. And she faxed to me some greetings that she would like, to me to, uh, like for me to read at this time. Before I do that, though, I would like for members of uh, the Holly family, uh, her sister, Ms. Morris, and uh, all the Holly family, if you all would stand um, very quickly before I read this so that we can recognize you all. We're so glad to have you all here. Thank you. Thank you so much. The greetings from Josephine Holly Jefferson. Good morning, Albany State University. Thank you, President Dunning, for inviting me to participate at another Founders Day celebration. Faculty, students, honored guests, I bring greetings to all of you from the Holly family. I look forward each year to returning to this campus where I grew up. Each year I look around and take great pleasure in discovering something new, something that affirms that Albany State University is always moving forward. And now you say a new beginning is on the horizon. I have witnessed many a new beginning here at ASU. From the beginnings of the small manual training school to Georgia Normal and Agricultural College to Albany State College to now Albany State University. Every new beginning has been a move forward, a move toward greater excellence. My father had a dream for a new beginning when he founded his school. His hard work and perseverance, his vision, fueled the growth of the school through its evolution from small private college to Albany State College. He too witnessed many new beginnings, but I don't think he knew he ever imagined this grand campus, these many fine buildings, the number of young people filled with energy, the energy of progress so evident here today. My father believed education to be the key to new beginnings. It was the belief, a passionate belief, that with a good education, anyone could move ahead. That vision was a catalyst for this university. Now 111 years later, the vision continues, and a new and very different world culture calls us once more to new beginnings. And education is still the key to progress. As President Obama has said, education is the great civil rights issue of our time. He is pushing for changes for investments of time and resources, for innovation, innovative ways to provide good quality education for all young people. That is why the most heartwarming and encouraging new beginnings I see each year when I return are the faces of the students, your faces. And each of you is on the brink of a new beginning as you prepare yourself for your future a future bright with promise. So as I stand here today on her behalf, on this handsome camp campus, I take courage and have hope for the future, bright with new beginnings that you will bring to pass. I wish you and your dedicated faculty continued success in building foundations for our greatest treasure, our young people. I am so pleased to be here with you in spirit today and ask that as we stand on the brink of yet another new beginning. I am always proud to join you in celebrating a legacy of which we are all a part. I encourage you to always honor and build upon the rich history represented in this place and to take hope in the encouragement, encouraging present. 
and I invite you to become a vital part of the history that is still to be written, the legacy for future generations. On behalf of Josephine Holly Jefferson, happy Founders Day. Thank you. Good morning. I am Dejane Thompson, the Student Government Association President, and it is my honor to bring you greetings to the faculty, staff, students, alumni, and members of the Holly family. Thank you for coming. Welcome to our 111th anniversary of our Founders Day Convocation. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. To Dr. Arthur N. Dunning and Mrs. Dunning, to our convocation speaker this year, Dr. Paul McKendrick, to the mayor of the city of Atlanta, to Mr. Jeff Signard, who is chairman of the Doherty County Commission, to our faculty, staff, students, soon to be alumni, and our alumni, I welcome you. There are many occasions that we remember birthdays, the first romantic date, graduations, the assassinations of John F. Kennedy as president, the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and Senator Robert F. Kennedy. We also remember the O.J. Simpson trial, the 9-11 attack on the Twin Towers, and most recently, the bombings at the Boston Marathon. All of us in this audience, regardless of our connection, recognize the occasion to be remembered today. We acknowledge the hardship and struggles endured, yet the futuristic educational ambitions and goals of a determined man. We have come back to our core, come back to our higher educational beginning come back to celebrate and commemorate Dr. Joseph Winthrop Holly, founder of this great institution. I again welcome you and thank you on behalf of the Albany State University National Alumni Association that you have remembered and we join in celebrating 111 years with a new beginning on the horizon. Thank you. Mr. Porter, you've worn so many hats at this university, I wouldn't be surprised if you had come out in the form of Mrs. Holly again today. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sure she would be very pleased with your reading that on her behalf. At this time, we will have another selection. Good morning. The ASU Chamber Singers will now sing for you a 16th century motet, Sikut Chervus, as the deer longs for cooling stream, as my heart longs for you, O oh God.
Thank you all again for that beautiful, beautiful rendition. Dr. Hawley said that when he closed the souls of black folks, he said, I got on my knees and I prayed, Lord, give me the courage to go to Doherty County and strike a blow at the ignorance portrayed by Dr. Du Bois. When he had that, after he prayed, his vision when he, when he came here was to educate our students so that they may go out and make significant contributions to society to help address some of the ills that he had identified. His vision is, is embodied in all of the students here at Albany State, a Holly ambassadors that you saw usher you in, as well as in Ms. Amber Lamar, who is our Student Government Association Vice President. Ms. Lamar will come and introduce our speaker. His deepest fear is not that he is inadequate. His deepest fear is that he is powerful beyond measure. It is his light, not his darkness, that frightens him. He asks himself, who am I to be brilliant, talented, and fabulous? Actually, the question should be, who is he not to be? As he let his own light shine, he unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. And as he is liberated from his own fear, his present automatically liberates others. Paraphrase from Marion Williamson poem. Good morning. There's a passage of scripture that states, this is the day that the Lord has made and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. And today, our speaker has come to share in this joyous occasion of Founders Day. He hails from the good life city of Albany, Georgia. He is a golden ram for life and a proud alumnus of the unsinkable Albany State University. He is a father, a son, a husband. He is a servant leader, an educator, a teacher, an administrator, a mentor. He is a preacher's kid, but more importantly, he is a man of God. He is a giver of his time, talent, and resources. Who is he? He is our Founders Day speaker for today. A man of vision, dedication, determination, hard work, and commitment. He is our fabric of a man, our courageous man. Our good man is hard to find. Our man on fire. Our, unstop our, our unstoppable, our what a man, what a man, what a mighty good man. <laughs> he is not easily broken and knows how to face the giant. Who is he? He is our Founders Day speaker. He is the superintendent of Tuscaloosa City Schools. In addition to being a graduate of ASU in English, he is also a graduate of Bowling Green State University in Ohio, where he received a Master's of Art degree in English, and a Harvard graduate earning a Master's in Administration, Planning, and Social Policy, and a Doctorate in Administration, Planning, and Social Policy, with a concentration in the Urban Superintendent's Program. Our speaker has held several teaching and administrative positions in Virginia and Massachusetts. In the area of school reform, he has, he has led academic reviews of instructional practices of failing schools. Previous positions held by the veteran education administrator include director of student support and attendance services, executive assistant to the superintendent for Long Beach Unified School District in California, principal of Roanoke City Schools, assistant principal and principal for Fairfax County Public Schools and instructor at Hampton University. And in terms of accolades, he is the re recipient of three awards presented by Harvard University. The E. Stevens Fellowship, 
the Chin Research Grant, the Urban Superintendent's Program Research Grant. Who is he? Ladies and gentlemen, stand to your feet and join me in welcoming our 2014 Founders Day speaker, our modern day Joseph Winthrop Harley. You can build a chimney from the top, Dr. Paul McKendrick. What a man, what a man, what a man, what a man. <laughs> when she walked down, I told, he, told her, you have just set me up. <laughs> I don't normally do this, but I'm going to ask that you just do something. This has nothing to do with my speech. But I just ask that you just... Um, Help me pray for a uh, family that we had. Um, I realized a few years ago, this just isn't a job for me. It really is a mission. And I lost one of my second graders, seven years old this morning. A little kid had a brain aneurysm yesterday. And we got the message as we were getting ready this morning that he died at 7.15. So if we could just pray for a few minutes with this family, because I really don't know how a family makes it when you lose a seven-year-old something that they had no in idea that this was true and I apologize for I don't want to put a pall over what is a very good ceremony but I, I just I place myself every one of my children in my school system I, they are mine and I tell the parents all the time they are my children but I treat them like grandchildren so you come and get them <laughs> But I, I just don't know how this family makes it when, you know, you have to call. I've had to do this a couple of things. So if we could just, just pray for this family just for a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this is quite an honor for me. I, I, when I got out of the car this morning, we parked next to my sister. And the first thing she said to me was, who would have ever thought? And I never would have thought. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm really honored to be here today. This, this is quite an honor for me. It's quite an honor for our family also. Um, when Dr. Dunning left Tuscaloosa, I mentioned to him to, to make sure that he takes care of my, my alma mater. And uh, I think the universe has done a, a wonderful thing in bringing in Art and his wife Karen because they do so much in the city of Tuscaloosa that I just look to see those same things happening here. Uh, I'm very proud of everything that, that, that uh, I've done in my professional career. Um, I've learned, though, that you do not always take to heart and take yourself so seriously when you get it, uh, introductions like that. Harvard University has a practice of, at the end of each first, first semester and second semester, where the professors then will sit and talk about their, their uh, students, if you're a first and second year student. So they have this open discussion. And they sit and talk about it. So they basically want to know if you're going to graduate. Don't be wasting their time. So if you're going to graduate, then you're fine. And they ask if you have your research done, and you, you have at least a topic of where you're going. Do you have your research questions and all of that? Well, my advisor then called me in and he gave me all, these inf all this information, you know, you're a really good student, uh, everybody's proud of you, and you know, coming from little tiny Albany State, you know, I'm sitting at Harvard University and they're telling me I'm a really good student, one of the top students, man, I was all that and more. <laughs> but God has a way of getting us back to our feet, <laughs> because when I stood up, 
I stepped on my shoestring and fell on my face. <laughs> Before I go forward, this is not going to be the uh, McKendrick family reunion here, but there's so many of us here because all of us really are uh, really excited about this. Uh, my mother-in-law is here, Miss Ellen Hudson, and Ms. I call her Bobo. I'll hear about this later. But she was past president of the, national, the uh, ASU National Alumni. If you have not become an alumni uh, member, uh, and if you don't plan on, you may not want to see her because she's going to tell you to become a member. <laughs> uh, she's done a wonderful job in that when you look at the number of, of members that have gone. My brother is here, my sister is here, my brother Calvin, my sister Anne, my sister Barbara is here. Barbara came all the way from Atlanta to see her little brother. <laughs> Calvin is a graduate of Auburn State. Um, my brother-in-law, Victor Hudson, is here. He's also a graduate of Albany State. His wife, Beverly, is here. Beverly is a graduate of Mercer. We won't, uh, if, if she had graduated from Fort Valley, I wouldn't have even acknowledged her. <laughs> my other sister is here, Valerie. Uh, Monica, my, my niece, and I have two other nieces, uh, Victoria and Dridri, Andrea. They just got married. Andrea got married in September. Not to each other. That didn't sound right. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea got married in September. She had a destination wedding in, in, in Jamaica. And Vicky got married in, in January. So if any of you know Victor and, and uh, Beverly, and if they owe you any money, don't ask them because they don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> Not with two weddings like that. Um, and I think I've, no. Uh, my wife is here, Kay. <laughs> now see, you didn't have to do that. Because just like I'm going to hear that from her mother, I'm going to hear it from her. But my wife is here, Kay Hudson McKendrick. Kay is, an, is also an ASU graduate. She graduated from here in art. My son, PJ, is here. PJ is going to be a graduate of the University of Alabama, uh, but he still supports Albany State. Uh, my cousin Silas is here and his sister Betty. And our legacy continues because I have a niece here, a grandniece, Kelsey McKendrick. Is she in here? I don't want to put you on the spot, so I can do that. Uh, and then uh, Catrice, I think, is coming here next year. So we have, we have always supported Albany State. Never thought of going anywhere else. Always supported it. I grew up right here in town. I had some of the best teachers ever. Um, Connie Mack and I, Connie Leggett and I were sitting talking about that earlier. Uh, I had the best teachers. I, I'm not going to make any adjustments to that. I had the best teachers. Um, I had a chemistry teacher in, in, at high school, Mr. Dr. Rockmore, taught us at the level of high school students, I'm sorry, college students when we were in high school. We don't find those kind of people now, unfortunately, but I just had some of the best teachers. And when we were there, we, we were operated around, a, I'm not sure if this is a um, saying or a poem, but there was this saying that we would have good, better, best, never let it rest until your good is better and your better is best, and I still do it. In writing this speech, the final copy is 10 iterations back. <laughs> Because when I thought I had the final copy, I kept changing because I, I wanted to get this right. And that's how I got into Harvard, and that's how I did all those other things. The wonderful thing about being a student at the time when I was in the schools that I went to is that none of our teachers told us that we were poor. Not one. Never ever told us about our socioeconomic condition. None of us. Most of us didn't know that we were poor. Most of us were very much like um, Dick Gregory in describing his family when he was a little kid. Uh, he described all of us. We weren't poor. We just didn't have any money. <laughs> and that makes a huge difference. But we didn't know that we were poor and didn't know this. I, I had not heard that word until I was in elementary school or, or word like that. If, you're as old as I am that when I was in elementary school, we used to have these programs called assembly programs or chapel programs. And um, 
one day there was a minister there, and I can remember the minister's name, and I'm not going to repeat it, but he came in and he talked to us and told us about the same things that our teachers told us about uh, persevering and doing the best that you can. It doesn't matter that you're poor or at risk. And that word, I was trying to figure out, what does at risk mean? I've never heard this. I never heard of poverty also. And trying to figure out what was he talking about, and then he started describing it. You're in areas that are violent, high crime rate, uh, low graduation rates, high dropout rates, and all of that, and then families that have just one, uh, one parent. And as I listened to that, I said, you know, this guy sounds like he's talking about me. <laughs> and so I ran home and, and walked in the house. Mama didn't work at that time and just said, Mama, did you know I was at risk? <laughs> and she looked and said, what does that mean? And so then I went back and told her all the things about high crime rate and violence and all of that. And she just looked at me and said, Paul, Jr., you're not at risk. And I just said, yes, I am. Yes, I am, because the man told us all these things today. And she just looked at me and said, honey, you're fine. You've taken all your shots, and you're going to be all right. <laughs> Coming to Auburn State was just something that I never, ever really troubled with. Because for me, it started when I was in elementary school. Auburn State used to play its football games uh, at Carver Park. And those of you, everybody knows where Slappy Drive is. Come east. If you don't know east, come back toward university. About four blocks over is this park. If you go about it's all the way down to the McDonald's, south Slappy. And so they used to play their games there. And so every Saturday and every time that we could get a chance, my friends and I would go and we'd try and get in the game. But we didn't have any money, so we would sit on the on the fence or we'd peek through these little um, wooden fences that were there and we'd watch the game. If we were lucky, nobody would be outside and they'd let us sit on the fence. At that time, somehow or another, my brother always had money, so he would pay to get in and could get in the games. I never had money. And at that point, though, so we would go as much as we can and try to get in. Sometimes we could and sometimes we couldn't. On one of those occasions, though, it was just one of those seminal moments, one of those significant moments in your life. Because I'd never seen anything like this, and it was the, I'm not sure what happened, whether it was a, um, an interception or a touchdown, but then when we looked at the stands, you saw something, or I saw something I'd never seen anywhere except in churches. And my dad was a Baptist minister too. But when you looked over there, when I looked over there, I saw these people in the band playing and then everybody moving in unison from one side to the other. And then they started singing, everybody loves ASC. And that was it. For me, I was hooked at that point. Because I, I had the feeling then that this was something that really was a good experience that I could partake of because everybody there seemingly had a good time and looked like everybody was taking care of each other. So it was something that I, I liked. From those moments then, the statute of limitations has passed so I can tell you some of the other crimes that we did. <laughs> <laughs> but we slipped into every game that we could get into. At one point when I got a driver's license, Albany State had its student IDs that looked very much like the Georgia driver's license. And so to try to get into the run to see the, uh, Coach Robert Rainey's running, gunning Rams, we would wait until the rest of the students get to the gate, and then we flash our, supposed to have been a student ID, but it was really our uh, driver's license, and just slip in. Nobody caught us most of the time. We would slip in also with football games when we were playing over at Mills Stadium. There were a couple of ways you'd get in. We'd slip in with the football team, the high school football team that they were going. If the coach turned his eye, we slipped in. We'd also stand and wait for the vending machine, the, uh, the Coke guy to come and help him and take a crate of sodas in, <laughs> put the sodas down and go into the stands. There was one way that you could get in because there are two entrances, there are two uh, end zones, of course. One was where they would have the um, car entrance, and then on the other end, there was this hill. Well, we didn't take that one, even though most of us knew that there was a gate, I'm sorry, a fence there that was in disrepair. All you had to do was go under the fence. 
But if you went under the fence, sometimes you had to slide down on your butt to get down to the rest of the thing. And we didn't want to do that because everybody knew that you had slipped in because you had all this dirt on you. <laughs> but I wasn't just interested in just um, good times here. I was an ASC and through and through, even as a little kid again. But we weren't always interested in just good times and games and sports and all the wonderful things that were happening on camps because we, we were reverent and we were respectful also. So we came over when Dr. William Dennis died, paid respects to him by visiting his grave. We knew many of the presidents. Uh, I think my favorite, and he was not here when I got here, uh, and that was um, Thomas Miller Jenkins. I think every student loved that man because on Friday, my brother was here then, they talked about on Fridays at football games, he'd walk in the student center and cancel classes. <laughs> you, you would see him at, uh, Art didn't hear that. <laughs> you would see him at, at football games and he'd be, be cheering on. So he was just the, the person that, that, again, that connection to the university. When I got here, it was, it was Dr. Hayes and Chuck Hayes and had that reverence and that quiet demeanor about him. And then there was also uh, Dr. Billy Black. I was gone by the time Dr. Black got here, but I was happy for him because he had worked through the system. And it was almost like a, a local guy that had become president of the university. So I was really happy. And with all of these things that I've given you, I was just thrilled when Dr. Dunning called and asked if I would do this because all I had were good experiences here. I could have graduated in three years, but I stuck around another year because I really enjoyed it. It was a wonderful <laughs> place. It was a wonderful place. And so my coming here either completely completes the circle or at least it adds to a number of wonderful experiences that I've had. Founders Day is a special day. Most people have said this um, previous to me. Um, Miss Modesty's words are almost like mine, so I could probably truncate this because I'm going to say some of the same things. Uh, but for historically black colleges, these days are incredibly important. And they are important because mainly historically black institutions like Albany State were created exclusively for us. And the sad part about that story and the other line of it is because there was nowhere else for us to go. But Founders Day should never be considered in, in the same breath as homecoming. Uh, homecoming is designed for good times. With all of us going from seeing our, our long lost friends and going to parties and uh, going to tailgates and all of that and then we have to put up with and enjoy those glorious splendid lies that our friends tell us. <laughs> but that's homecoming. It's also not to be confused with commencement. Because at commencement, a speaker has, you guys could ask, call me back for commencement. I could do that speech easily. <laughs> because in that one, if you're the speaker, you really should just be doing a couple of things. Thanking the students, thanking the parents, giving them a few hints about life, and then getting out of the way. Um, but for Founders Day, though, while it does not have to convey that solemn and uh, serious tone, it should be one that where we give honor, as most of the speakers have mentioned, we're giving honor to the people who uh, started this institution. And I think it was Ms. Modesti that mentioned that uh, Dr. Holly didn't do this by himself. The Hazard family did quite a bit in, with their funds. And during that time that when he was doing this, it, it, he realized that this was a monumental task because nothing was promised to him, absolutely nothing. He had to beg and scrape for everything to make this. And uh, with Albany State, of course, being in a southern state, Georgia was the last state, the last state, to see and have some kind of reason for honoring and, and providing some kind of assistance for African Americans in, this, in this, this, this area. Because there were no incentives. Because the southern states were the same states that years ago had enslaved millions of us so it was inconsistent then for them to now come forward and say that now we're going to educate you. We also have to think about at that point, or years before that, that a black person learning to read was a punishable offense. In some cases, it was an offense that a person could kill for, be killed for. So we should praise Dr. Holly for, and his supporters, all of those people who persevered through struggles and barriers in establishing the Albany Bible and Manual Training Institute in 1903. But when you think about it, it took 38 years since emancipation 
38 years for someone to come forward and say, let's put a university here. 38 years. It took 52 years after emancipation for the state to finally give funding. And that funding came and when the school then was, this was in 1917, then when the school became uh, the Georgia Normal and Agricultural College and with that the college became a two-year agriculture and teacher training. But it, it, it just breaks my heart when I look at what happened. It took 67 years after emancipation for the state to come forward and place the university under the, the umbrella of the Georgia University system. And when that happened, the state gave the system more money. Not going to say it covered all of the bills, because that will never happen. But it gave the, system, the school, the college, more money. And in 1932, that's then when the school became Albany State College, which is now Albany State University. My original thoughts were to talk about the legacy of this, this, this university. But in looking at the research, most of those who are presidents and, and those people who run um, historically black universities, they have come to the conclusion that when you talk about the legacy, that's, that's kind of a, a um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with the legacy. But if we spend too much time talking about the past, we never get ready for the future. And that has become one of the the bad things for us as, as, as institutions. So celebrating, um, celebrating the past is wonderful, but we've got to look at the future. And so when I look then at our, our theme, there is a new beginning on the horizon. For me, that suggested far more, so I needed to look at more than just our, our, our legacy. Celebrating our legacy, however, and celebrating uh, the fact that we beat the odds and recognizing those who had a vision should be part of our culture, and it is a part of our culture, but in this present day, we should not believe that the struggle is over, because it isn't. Uh, Founders Day, though, and looking at legacy, especially during these times of the best of times and some of the worst of times for our schools, should be secondary to thriving in the present and planning for the future. It should be secondary to developing a path with specific strategic plans that, are con that will continue the uh, sustainability of our universities, especially this one after 111 years. Legacy should not be more important than finding a way that we have to never ever deal with the insults and the pain that come when people raise the questions of, are colleges like Albany State relevant? 150 years later, because 150 years was about the time that Wilberforce University started, first historical black college, even after that, we still find that we have to ask, answer that question. Um, and we find ourselves flourishing in some instances and then not doing so well, especially in this po political climate that we find ourselves in. And the political climate that we're in, most of you can tell through what you read in the paper, um, seems unfriendly to those in greatest need. So how do we interpret the theme then of this this Founders Day activity. Uh, and the theme is there is a new beginning on the horizon. What data does one have to indicate that there is a new beginning coming? Is the beginning an edict or is it a foreshadowing? As an edict, it becomes an authoritative command. As a foreshadowing, it tells us and notes some occurrence or some experience that is possibly coming. In either case, when you think of this university going forward, I think that we have to look at change. And I think we have to look at planning for change. Some of that preparation, I think, will probably be, would be well if we start looking at just answering that question in definitive terms, this whole idea of relevance. You don't find that question being asked of almost any other university or any kind of university, but it's being asked of schools like, like Auburn and State. The question is becoming more and more prevalent in, in higher education, and you also hear it in state legislatures. Uh, Wall Street Journal recently published an article by Jason and Naomi Riley in which they said that um, HBCUs serve students poorly. Uh, have become something of an expensive, ineffective, archaic relic. Richard Vetter wrote in a Chronicle of Higher Education a little bit later, this, and he cited um, 
Howard University. Most of us think of Howard University as being the HBCU, and his point was that uh, Howard University spends $22,000 per, per year per student. These are funds that they get from the, from the federal government. His point and his suggestion was that you close the school and then just give the students the $22,000 and let them go to any school other than an HBCU. What those authors don't realize is that HBCUs have a place in our, in our history and a place in our society for students because it expands the options for a number of students. They also don't know and talk about the support that HBCUs give to students. And if you back this up even farther, they never talk about some of the schools, some of the schools that send children to HBCUs. And some of those schools aren't focused on, on making our children ready for the world. And so they get here and we have to expand their worlds and, and give them that support so that they can do that kind of work. What is also lost in those comments and those arguments is the fact that nobody cites and nobody goes back and look at the number of students who go to the, our most, most prestigious institution for graduate work and those students coming from HBCUs. Harvard University, my place. If you're a student uh, from an HBCU, what, it, what has happened in the last year or so, the data show that 95% of the students who go there graduate. Children that go to Amherst from HBCUs, the data show that 94% of those students graduate. Yale University, students that go there from HBCUs, the data show that 93% of those students graduate. And so where then is the substance that HBCUs are not relevant? And if you ask that question, are they relevant? If my mother-in-law was not standing here, I'd give you a stronger answer. I'll just say yes. Because <laughs> she'll let me hear about it later. And you look throughout our history, throughout our history, it's too much for me to talk about, but if you look at, uh, we talked about W.B. Du Bois. Where would we be without NAACP? Du Bois was one of the co-founders. Where would we be without all of the writers and the artists and, and that went to HBCUs? Where would we be without uh, Toni Morrison, a graduate of, of Howard University? Where would we be without the, the poetry of Langston Hughes, a graduate of Lincoln University? Coachman Park Elementary School, where I went to school, is no longer there. But it was one of those places that, that we loved, and that, that lady was the first African-American woman to get a, um, an Olympic gold. Then you have two people that I just think are just wonderful people. Where would we be without Thurgood Marshall? You know, legal counsel to the NAACP. He's also a Supreme Court judge. And then again, other than Christ, one of the greatest people I thought that ever lived in this and had such a short life, Martin Luther King. Where would we would be without Martin Luther King? graduate of Morehouse. So you cannot say that black institutions are not relevant. There are other data then that you look at. Black institutions take up only 4%, only 4% of all of the universities in this country. There are only 105. But when you look at the graduates that come from schools like my alma mater, 21% of students who get, African American students who get degrees come from black institutions. 21% of students who graduate, I'm sorry, 18% of the black engineers, black institutions. 31% of students, I'm sorry, bio, black biological scientists and mathematicians, African American schools. 42% of, of African American agriculturists or farmers, African American schools. 25% of business degrees, African American schools. 17% of those in health profession, profession, including doctors, African American schools. And this last one just blew me away because as a superintendent, I didn't know that this was true. Almost 50% of black teachers in this country, African American schools. So if I had given you a stronger response, you would have understood why I would have. Because there's nothing in anything that I've just said that indicates that these schools do not count. And there's this whole idea about 
bringing this question of relevance really should just be pushed apart. We have to do those kind of things. We as graduates have to do those kind of things so that these don't become, because before you know it, I you know, saw this this morning, the, the sad thing about what happened at Fort Hood. I was listening, listening where we were in the hotel, and at Fox Radio, t television. I got the same view. <laughs> But Fox Television, the commentators there were blaming the president on it. You know, the president didn't have anything to do with that. And if we, don't, if we don't tell that story, that's the story that's going to be on Fox. That's the story that's going to get the legislators. That's going to be the story that's going to cut funding. Because then those are the ways that you close the doors on schools like ours. Um, so yes, we are relevant. We have to do this. We have to plan because if we don't, we are not going to be part of that whole makeup of the global uh, economy that is out there. And we all know what that looks like. While the State of the Union and, and, and the country is strong, you, we do find out that, that that's not necessarily true for children and for people of color. Moder moder modernity has its gifts and benefits, but it's also influenced how we interact and care for others. We thought that with the election of the president that a lot of this had been, we had gotten rid of it, everyone was celebrating, and maybe this country has gotten to the point that it deals with class and it deals with race, because that was the one flaw in our, in our portrait. That's not necessarily true. And while the political current and climate is different from that in Dr. Holly's time, politics today seemingly has a constant assault on all of those programs that are there to help people in need. And as students who came here, we were all people of need. And so this struggle goes on. Because when you look at some of the other data, there are more poor people in this country now than in the history of this country. Uh, poverty and wealth gap has increased. We have Congress not extending unemployment benefits. And when I see things like that, I think about my little children, my little 11,000 children, a lot of them poor and free reduced lunch, what happens when that family doesn't have any money? And we also have a higher percentage of children who are poor. That number has spiked up just a little bit. We saw some of this during the presidential election when Romney talked about that 47 percent. It's a 47 percent of people that he said who were poor and always believed that they were entitled to health care food costs, housing. Somewhere in that conversation was a, was a comment about poor people deserve their fate. Now, if I'm stepping on someone's toes, just tell me to leave. But that, that, that is not something that, that our colleges want us to do, and that's not something that our colleges had us, prepared us for, and, and our colleges got us to the point of, of taking care of people. So this is foreign and inconsistent with what we learn what I learned on this university's campus, and that's why we have to tell this story. That struggle continues because about two weeks ago, you saw Paul Ryan saying the same thing. Now, I'm not going to make this a political manifesto of any sort, but the point of it is, is that Paul Ryan controls the budget, and he made the comment that this was mostly a culture of dependency. To support his view, he, he then talked about a student that he had had lunch with in an elementary school, and that the child was on free and reduced lunch, and to support himself or support his comment, Ryan said that the child commented that he ate his free reduced lunch because it left him with a full stomach, but it also left him with an empty soul. Reporters found out later that there was no such conversation and that there was no such child. Later in an interview, Ryan said, we have this tailspin of culture in our inner cities in particular of men not working and just generations of men not even thinking of working and learning the value of work. So how much is the struggle of our schools related to this kind of thinking? Because Ryan's thinking, and that of a number of other people, looks at it that there's an easy way of solving poverty. This, these are the ways that are in vogue, and that you do that by accepting many of the untruths and misconceptions about 
poverty. And one of those is that it's always in urban centers and that the government should not give people assistance and that people stay poor because they don't work. When we know that none of the, there is no research out there that shows that very little of it, that work, and we know that you eradicate poverty by attacking that which perpetuates it, like discrimination, like mass incarceration, like poor schools and poor education for children, like uh, limited wages, uh, as opposed to having a living wage, people looking at uh, minimum wage, and all of these limited experiences and, and, and opportunities. And the same folk that you have out there railing against almost any program that, that is there to help poor people. And so they complain about Social Security and health care, um, minimum wage, student loans, student loans, student loans, student loans. I said that for a reason, because th that, th those funds come to help all of us. And when we're silent, those funds get cut, 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 cut. Whoever's in, in uh, uh, student aid or financial aid office knows exactly what I'm talking about when you talk about the Parent PLUS loan. That loan has been uh, set so that the criteria is different. And uh, Historically, black colleges then are looking at possibly losing uh, two to 300 students per year. This struggle then that I'm talking about is, is real because when you look in the last 10 to 15 years, we've lost five black colleges. Uh, Prentice Institute, Mary Holmes College in Mississippi, Bishop College in Texas, St. Paul's College in Lawrenceville, Virginia, and Morris Brown is close to that. We also see it with the, the loss of um, presidents because since 2003, eight presidents in black colleges have, have left, Stillman, Shaw, Tuskegee, Howard, Norfolk State, Wilberforce, Tennessee State, Morris Brown. Grambling's football program and the problems that they had over the spring, that was more about the financial um, security and health of, the, of the, the university rather than the fact that the school did not play uh, Jackson State on its homecoming. It takes about $2 million to run a, an athletic program in a small college. Uh, Grambling's problem started years ago, it just progressed and it got even worse when you look at the governor of that state cut their funding for public education about, in about half. Grambling is not alone because we find out that black colleges are having to play uh, these powerhouse schools like uh, Florida State and Ohio State and that happened last year with Florida and m losing 76 to nothing to Ohio State and Miami beat Savannah State by 77 points. But Grambling would love to have been there because those schools got great payoffs. You know, uh, Grambling, I'm sorry, Florida and m received $900,000 and Savannah State $375,000. Another story that is not as sexy is one when you look at Howard University again because back in April, the vice president of their um, board of trustees wrote a letter and the letter was leaked to the Washington Post. And her comment was that if there were not changes made at Howard, you think of Howard University, the, probably the epitome of, of, of um, in most people's mind, of, of historically black colleges. Her comment was that if things did not change in three years, Howard would have to close. All of this is related to money, and all of this related to planning for the future. And that's why I did, gave all of that to say that it's related to funding, it's related to planning, it's related to us being active. It's related to us being advocates for our schools because if we don't, we could have the same fate of those five that I gave you. Um, that's the point that I'm, I'm making. And then specifically, all of us who say that we love this university, all of us who come back here and do these kind of things then for the university. Um, uh, all of us then have to do something that, that helps us. Um, because what we see on the horizon then um, is, I think, it, it just makes us have to become part of this culture of, of philanthropy and this culture of giving. And I can stand here and talk about it, and I've done that. Or I could stand here and model it, and I will do that too. I'm going to challenge all of you who are graduates of this university to find ways of providing funding for us. 
Uh, all of us go back to our hometowns so we can start these smaller alumni associations. We can take it upon ourselves to provide a scholarship for at least one child, at, even, even if it's every other year, because that makes a difference. I'm going to model this this morning because my wife's son and I are pledging $10,000 to the university. Because I feel so strongly for it. I feel so strongly about it. Um, I couldn't have gone and done anything with, without the teachers that I mentioned earlier and without this place. Um, it, it helped not only with me and my content and knowledge of, of that, but it's also the whole idea of working and, and taking care of people. My struggle with my little student, that was part of being here. Uh, I'm not independently wealthy. I've got two mortgages, <laughs> three cars and two payments. But I'm doing this um, because what I see on the horizon tells us that we have to prepare. The Darden proposal is not new. The Darden proposal was out there when I was in high school. It has just ramped up, and the drums are beating louder because of who proposes it. You guys may not ever ask me back with what I'm saying, <laughs> but, but that, those are the kind of things that we have to prepare for. And if we do that, then we can, we can change the, the story and talk about what we are doing well. I'm also doing this because of a mother that came out of, uh, I was coming out of one of my schools, Martin Luther King Elementary School. We do not refer to it as MLK. Um, I was coming out one day and a mother stopped me and, and said, I just want to meet you. I've never met you, but I simply want to thank you for giving my little boy hope. And she said, I have a high schooler that went through before you got here. I've been in Tuscaloosa two years. My uh, little child is a fourth grader and uh, I now see a child that wants to go to school. Martin Luther King, before I got there two years ago, had scores in the 40s, 40% 40 of children passing. We now have children in the passing test, uh, mathematics tests especially, 90% of students passing. <laughs> and what is so amazing is the same teachers, same teachers. But 95% of us children in fourth, fifth grade pass a math test. Nobody ever thought it would happen. No one ever thought. So I, I'm doing this for that child. I'm doing this for that mom. Uh, that mother realizes and has a strong belief in the power of hope. Um, we have this saying on our refrigerator that my wife put on. And it's by a, a writer named Chris Swingle. And Swingle writes, of all the forces that make for a better world, none is more powerful than hope. With hope you can think, you can work, you can dream. If you have hope, you have everything. Dr. Holly found that this glorious place in 1903 intent on improving the lives of others. Now it's our turn to do that, and it's our turn to heed the call and rise and stand on the shoulders of those who came before us and continue his mission, not his legacy. We need to continue his mission and I want all of us to walk out of here uh, with success on our minds. And Ralph Waldo Emerson had that you look at success by, uh, quote, to laugh often and much, to win and respect the intelligent person and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a bit better, whether by a healthy child a garden patch or a redeemed social condition. To know even one life has breathed either easier because of you, this has been a success. It is important that all of us support Albany State as it prepares its graduates for the 21st century, still as a relevant, innovative university, well-versed in preparing our children, as one author put it, in the art of producing greatness. This can be done. It is important that we get it done, because if we don't, we will be forced to sit on the sidelines and then wonder and imagine what could have been. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. McKendrick, for reminding us of our relevance. 
At this time, I would like to present to you a plaque on behalf of the university. Isn't it nice? And it reads, what a man, what a man, what a mighty good man. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. It actually reads, thank you for being our speaker and everything. <laughs> I wanted to add that one a man part because of that $10,000 in my new capacity. Thank you. At this time, we will enjoy another rendition. Dr. Dunning, would you please come forward? Because Albany State University has been in existence for 111 years, but it's because of the hard work and dedication of our faculty members, of our staff, and our numerous employees. Today, we'd like to acknowledge employees who have dedicated 25 years of service to Albany State. At this time, when we call your name, if you would enter on that side, receive your plaque, and then exit on this side. Let me do a couple of things before we get to the employees. Let me add my welcome to you this morning. Thank all of you for being here. I also want to recognize my wife, Karen, and our son, Ellison. And uh, I was thinking about that, but when Paul paused uh, before he was recognizing uh, his wife, I thought, I am, I am sure going to get this right. <laughs> but I'm, I'm delighted that they're here this morning with us as well. But I also want to recognize Mayor Hubbard. I've known her for a long time. She's just a delightful woman, and I'm uh, glad that she's here. And Dr. Paul Jones, I think Paul is in here, but Paul is at Darden College and he and I are good colleagues and we're really looking to serve this institution. Thank you, Paul. Let me do a couple of things in the way of adding a little context to this conversation this morning. We're here to recognize Dr. Holly and I'm just delighted to be a part of this. This was a man with a lot of vision 
But I want to put this context around what he did and how he did it. He led this place through the Depression. And this was a, a time that just knocked the wind out of this country, the Depression. He was here down in southwest Georgia, keeping this place moving along through one of the worst calamities this, this nation has ever seen. He also led it through World War I, which was from 1914 to 1918. He was still right down here working when we were conducting a war in Europe. He also led it through World War II. World War II started in 1939 and finished in 1945. I think he left in 1943. He also led it during the great migration of African Americans out of the South, this African American diaspora that went to Chicago, out of Mississippi, Detroit, out of Alabama, and over here in Georgia, up to the Atlantic coast. So we started to lose people around 1940. So Dr. Holly was toiling in southwest Georgia. But I also want you to think about one thing he had was vision. And 46 years ago on today, Martin Luther King was shot in Memphis, April 4th. And I want you to think about that. These were two extraordinary men who had a vision about this nation. So 46 years ago, King was, was shot in Memphis, and Dr. Holly gave his life to Southwest Georgia. That's why we all assembled here. That's what this whole issue is about. And Dr. Holly was born around the time when the system that was placed in the South called the Jim Crow system, and it lasted to about 1964, 65. So this man lived a lot of American history, this 20th century history. And he was here in a place where the, the struggle was normal, hard work was normal. And so I want us to kind of remember as we leave this place today what this is all about. We've heard about his academic background, but two or three things that caught my attention. One, he was an educator. He was just down to his genes. He was a, a man of, who wanted to educate people. He was a philosopher who thought deeply and broadly about things about life and the nature of life. And he founded this place that we're sitting here today that I don't get up any morning that I'm not happy to get here because I have a deep sense of the shoulders we stand on in this part of the country especially. A lot of people have given a lot of hard work. And so I want us to do what they did for us. I want to I use this with Mr. Porter a lot. I, help me think about how I can place a special burden on these young men on this campus. Because what happened with King, he placed a special burden on himself. He lost his life. Dr. Holly placed a special burden on himself. So we have young men walking around this campus. And my wife reminds me, young women too. Uh, she, she says that all the time. So I'm talking about young people in general. What can we do with this generation that these two men did and this man gave his life to? So I want us to reflect on that as we leave. But I also want to th take a moment, and you met him earlier, but uh, Mr. Jeff Senior, and he said, I'm affectionately called Bodine. And, uh, and I did not realize that until I was all across Georgia, and, and nobody calls him Jeff, they call him Bodine. But, but Jeff, thank you for being here. We're delighted that you've been part of this, and you've served this campus and served this community as well. I'm going to ask uh, Ms. Helen Black to come up, and uh, I want to be with me for a few minutes to talk about a few things before we get to the employees. So, Ms. Black, if you would come. When I assumed this position, I did not talk about this very much to anyone, but I knew one thing I was going to do when I got here. We were going to do something to honor Billy C. Black, and we were going to... He was the eighth president of Albany State University. This building we're sitting in now, the ACAD building, will be named for the Billy C. Black Building. <laughs> and, let, and let me tell you how this process started. I met with Mrs. Black and her two children and had breakfast in my office. 
and I sought their permission to allow me to go forward with this recommendation. And they gave me the green light, and I wanted her to say something about it, but she said, she looked to her son. She said, let him speak first. I thought, that's a nice touch as a man. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> but so they both spoke and said, we, we very much honor that, and we would be delighted if you would do that. Ms. Black, I want to say a couple of things about your husband that you knew better than I would ever. But he increased our degree programs on this campus from 12 to 23, and he increased the terminal degree, the PhD or the EDD, to 66%. The university assumed control of his programs. We were doing programs in collaboration with Alabama State and Georgia State University Education, uh, and I believe business. We were able to bring those programs here and to fully operate those programs. We went on external support, which is what Dr. McKendrick has just done, from 750000 to about $7.6 million on his leadership. Our endowment increased from $50,000 to 750000 and we became accredited by all the major accrediting agencies. There was the establishment of a presidential scholarship program. We also had rapid enrollment growth. We doubled enrollment under his leadership. And he established something that I'm finding uh, that they are very passionate about on this campus. And I've kind of gotten religion myself about it. It's called the Fountain City Classic in, Colum <laughs> in, in Columbus. So I want to say thank you for being his life partner. Thank you for allowing us to celebrate his life. Thank you for staying the course with us. And we are going to have, at some point soon, a very special session out in front of this building when we get the name on it and have an unveiling, but we want you to be present. But I wanted you to know this and also publicly acknowledge this in your presence. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So now let's move to the 25-year employees. Ms. Gwendolyn Hurd, she's in Central Stores, and she started February 13th, Michael Simmons, Facilities Management. He came in on April 17th, 1989. And Mr. Dennis Johnson, also in Facilities Management, July 24th, 1989. College of Business, Dr. B. Oten, O.J. McKendy. And Ms. Yolanda Penn, Learning Support.
and lastly, Dr. Michael Rogers, College of Business. Five years of service. That's amazing. Thank you all so much. Thank you. At this time, there are a few acknowledgments that we like to make. We've already acknowledged the Holly family. We have acknowledged our former, the, the first lady, the former first lady, and Mayor Dorothy Hubbard. Thank you again for being here. We'd also like to acknowledge Greg Edwards, who's an alum. If you're here, would you please stand? There you are. I was looking for you. I moved over. I'm extremely pleased to acknowledge this next person, the former mayor of Camilla. She's an alum, Mary Jo Haywood. She happens to be my mom. <laughs> She's going to get me for saying that. <laughs> for putting her on the spot, rather. County Commissioner Senior, thank you again for being here. We have Mr. Kenneth Cutts, who is here representing Sanford Bishop. We would like to acknowledge the alumni board members. Would you all please stand, as well as the past, all of the past alum presidents. Thank you. Thank you. We have one, president, one alum who raised her hand. I want to make sure that you all um, did recognize her. Would our retirees from Albany State University please stand and be acknowledged? Thank you again for your contributions to Albany State. And of course, a lot of the work that's done here that keeps the university viable and vibrant is because of the faculty and staff. Would you all please stand as well? <laughs> Dr. Holly started this school because he wanted students to make contributions to help society become better. So all of the dynamic students here at Albany State University, please stand. Thank you all as well. We would not be here were it not for the students. Listen to me, amen. <laughs> I want to make another announcement. There is an alumni luncheon in the Reese Multipurpose Building. They've already provided tickets, but it's $50 at the door to attend. It's going toward an excellent cause. There's also an alumni business meeting in Simmons Hall today at 2 o'clock p.m. And this evening, at the request of the students who want to make sure that they mingle and associate with the alum more, we're going to be having an alumni student fish fry at Sanford, on Sanford grounds beginning at 6 p.m. and ending, ending at 9. At this time, before we sing the alma mater, we would like to retire the colors.
right? Bank. Freeze it. On. Order. On. Retrieve. Close. was the case with Dr. McKendrick, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the committee and all of its hard work for this fabulous program today. So please, <laughs> thank you all so much for those hours that you put in. And finally, before we go as well, I want to acknowledge all of the alum. One more time, give yourselves a vibrant <laughs> round of applause. Thank you all so much. We will now have the grave site ceremony and we look forward to seeing you all there. Thank you. Anybody here come step for the master Austin? Anybody here come step for the master Austin? I'll say, well, I will stand up for the Lord, because I made the Lord my choice. So if nobody else will stand for the master Austin, Austin. Anybody here gonna stand for the master? I'll stand. I'll stand. I'll stand. Anybody here gonna stand for the master? I'll stand. I'll stand. No, oh, I will stand up for the Lord, cause I made the Lord my choice. So if nobody else will stand for the master, I'll stand. I'll stand. Stand up for the master. Stand up for the Lord. Stand in the power of Jesus' mind with my shield and sword. If I will stand for Jesus. I'll fall for anything the devil brings up. Nobody else will stand for the master. I'll stand, I'll stand. Stand up for the master. Stand up for the Lord. Stand in the power of Jesus' mind with my shield and sword. If I will stand for Jesus, I'll fall for anything the devil brings up. Nobody else will stand for the master. I'll stand, I'll stand. Anybody here gonna stand? Anybody here gonna stand? Anybody here gonna stand? I'll stand. I'll stand. I'll stand. I'll stand. Anybody here gonna stand? I'll stand. Anybody here gonna stand? I'll stand. Anybody here gonna stand? I'll stand. 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 I
great man, Dr. Joseph Winthrop Holly. Father, we thank you for every person that has attended this institution. We thank you, Father God, for what you have done in this place in the last 111 years. And Father, we are so grateful, even for the students that are here now, who will make a great mark in the earth. And Father, we ask you to bless your people with multiple blessings, and God do great things in their life, in the lives of your people. God, we honor you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me say first, thank you for this great opportunity to share with you this afternoon. My fellow alumni, President Dunning and your team, faculty, staff, and friends of this great institution, Albany State University. I can tell you that when I was a student here over 20 years ago, and yes, I know that's hard to believe because I don't look that old, I had no idea that my life would have turned out the way it has having authored five books and helping others to become self-published authors has been the highlight of my life. I've come a long way from the political science major in Simmons Hall, who spent most of her time in Holly Hall. I know that's strange. I have taken so many things with me, no matter where I've gone or what I've done, the one thing that stands out is a sense of being a part of a larger family, a camaraderie that is both sustainable and genuine. I'm writing a thesis for my completion of my master's, and in it I talk about my connection to Albany State and how it helped to shape me as a person. My connection goes back to the early 70s when two of my aunts and an uncle attended this university. I remember as a kid being led out of Sanford Gym, kicking and screaming because of the loud sound coming from the band at a basketball game. I could not have been more than four or five years old, but I remember it. The beat of those drums scared me to death, 
But what I equated that time and that time with and my time here at Albany State as a student was that in order to be successful and relevant, I had to be willing to step to the beat of my own drum. This is who I believe Dr. Holly was, a man who stepped to the beat of his own drum. By doing so, he has produced a band of thousands of drummers who also have been called to step to the beat of their own drums. It is the sound of those drums that will usher in a new beginning. People, graduates becoming trailblazers in their respective fields, pioneers unafraid to do what no one else has done. We will increase in numbers as pioneers because of Dr. Holly's example. He took a piece of land here in a racist South 111 years ago and started a revolution. We must not be afraid of that word, revolution. It simply means change. Dr. Holly knew that in order for African Americans to do anything, they first needed to have an education. So he decided he was going to be the change agent of his generation. He set into motion the education of thousands, affected many families and grew multiple communities. There is a new beginning on the horizon. We must no longer see ourselves as just graduates of Albany State University, but we must see ourselves as fruit of the work of this great man. We see that Dr. Holly had a seed and a seed must go into the ground in order to bear fruit. We stand here today before the seed that was Albany Bible Emanuel Training Institute, then Georgia Normal Agricultural College, Albany State College, now Albany State University. <clears throat> Dr. Holly, we are your fruit. Because of your great work, the tree is massive. It spreads out of this place into different parts of the globe. What started out as one seed, Dr. Holly, is now immeasurable fruit. We are producing, breaking down barriers, exceeding against the odds, exercising the fullness of our gifts and talents. We are potential realized. Have you thought of yourself as fruit or as a graduate? Today, we are challenged to see ourselves as not merely graduates, staff, faculty of this institution, but to see ourselves as the fruit of Dr. Joseph W. Holly. We don't just see him as the founder or as the first president of, to serve here, but we see him as the seed, the seed of vision and purpose. When we walk about the campus for various reasons, we remember that here lies the seed but here stands the fruit. We are the fruit of Dr. Joseph Holly. And since we are fruit, we are pioneers. We can leave a great legacy in the earth. As I prepared for this memorial, I wondered if Dr. Holly had an inkling of what would be the magnitude of his vision. Did he foresee this huge campus on those 50 acres of land? Did he look at, at the first graduating class and know they would be the first graduates among thousands? Did he see future educators, entrepreneurs, scholars, artists, doctors, lawyers, and so on? Did he see me? Did he see you? What did he see? Then it dawned on me, does greatness ever really knows, recognizes it, it, its greatness? Does a seed have any idea of the fruit encased in it? One seed produces much fruit, but does it know that? Does the seed know that inside of its fruit? I had to stop thinking about it because I, I don't really know. I do know this one man, Dr. Holly, had a vision, executed it, and left it for us to do the same in our communities. As we take a step into this new beginning that is on the horizon, let us not forget from whence we came. Our associations to the university go deeper than what it is readily apparent. We are more than graduates, friends, employees, students. We are the fruit of the seed that is Dr. Joseph Winthrop Holly. Thank you.
Thank you, Reverend Anderson. And at this time, I would like Mr. Michael Morris, Ms. Antoinette Skipper, Mr. Dimitri Nader, and Ms. Daisy Thompson to come forward to later. 